You feel like you're getting weaker, but is that actually true? What should you do if you clean more than you jerk? And how can you stop clerking the bar on heavy attempts? Welcome back to the Last Set, Best Set podcast where myself and Coach Calvin dive deep answering your questions on Olympic weightlifting, strength, and building muscle. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Welcome back to the Last Set, Best Set podcast. I'm Coach Brian. I'm the owner of Big Ben Strength. I've been coaching weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting for the last 10 years, and I create educational videos, articles, guides, and programs about Olympic weightlifting for beginners and intermediates and coaches so you don't have to make the same mistakes that I did. Hey everyone, I'm Coach Calvin. I've been lifting for about three years now, and I'm current captain of Lindenwood University's Olympic weightlifting program. Uh, we're actually two-time national champions in my time here, and six-time national champions total. Uh, in the last year, I've been I've, I've met and been considered um, for the the junior Pan Am team. I, I met a minimum total to be considered, um, as well as being a coach, uh, working with mostly intermediate to advanced athletes. And today we've got some questions that you guys actually submitted to us uh, on social media, uh, just directly texting me and uh, and all that. But if you guys want your questions answered on the podcast, then make sure to click the Google form link down in the description below. Uh, let's go ahead and get into question number one here. Um, at Enos Bobani on Instagram asks, why do you think clarking the bar happens? Um, you want to explain what clarking is? Yeah, totally. Uh I'm not sure what years it was, but there, there's a guy named Ken Clark, um, and, and he would uh, prepare for a lift, you know, chalk up his hands, get ready. You know, maybe it's his opener. Maybe it's, you know, a big third attempt for a medal. Um, it didn't really matter. This just happened to him all the time. He would go up to the bar, um, go to lift it, and, you know, maybe it'd get past his knees, get up to his hip, and that's as far as it would go. He would just drop it from there, not even trying to get under it. Um, so yeah, basically clarking is when you lift a bar off the floor, you know, to above your knee about usually, um, and you don't even make an attempt to, uh, get under it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is something that kind of happens with a lot of beginners. A lot of people is they're starting to maybe get into ways that they are kind of afraid of a little bit. So some of the, some of the reasons that this could happen, um, confidence I think is probably the most important reason, the biggest reason that this is happening. If you're not confident about the attempt that you're going to take, um, then it's hard to talk yourself into getting it off the ground, much less trying to dive under that bar. You know, we talk about cleans, snatches. It is a, it's a scary lift. It's scary movement, especially we're trying to do stuff that is um, beyond what the average person is, is doing or even thinking about doing. Like if you <laughs> send a, send a video of you trying a snatch uh, to your mom. What is she going to say about it? That's usually kind of how most people are thinking about it. It's scary. Uh, and so, you know, if you don't have the confidence to subvert all of that, to overcome that fear of getting under a heavy barbell, it's going to be really hard to get your body to commit to getting under it too. Um, so usually confidence is a big part of that. Um, uh, another reason, this isn't necessarily the main reason, would just be weak pulling strength. This can be the case, um, but even if somebody's got weak pulling strength, most of the time, like their technique or their ability to get under heavy barbells is usually not limited by that pull strength. It can be, but most of the time it's not. So if that is something you struggle with, I would maybe just do more pulls, go a little bit heavier on those, get your back strong. Um, but yeah, so what, what did you think about? What do you think about uh, Clarking? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, well, as far as the weak pull strength, like a heavy clean is going to feel like a heavy deadlift off the floor. It's going to feel... Like, you're like, there's no way I'm getting under this. You have to maintain position. You have to hold your positions. And you'll surprise, your, surprise yourself a lot with what you can do. Um, most people, to make a clean, um, most, like, decent, decently high intermediate level weightlifters only need to pull the bar to around their belly button height. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and you'd be surprised with what weights you can do that with. Um I know, Brian. Do, do you remember our uh, our seminar we did um, mm -hmm. back in May? Yeah. Um, so at the end of that seminar, uh, I, I was going for a big clean max out, and I, the best I had I'd ever done, I, I believe, was like 150 kilos in the past. Um, <laughs> and you know, we were really loading on some weights, 
um, some heavy weights. So I, I believe we went, you know, one, 152, 157, uh, 161. Um, so already PRing by a lot. Um, and then we, we threw on 166 for a huge PR. And I, I, remember, I just remember how that felt off the floor. I was like, whoa, this is like moving slow. This is moving really slow. Stayed patient, cleared the knees, got it to my hip, um, and, and got under it. I think it's really important to grab the bar with confidence um, and not to sit there, hands on the bar for too long, overthinking how heavy it is or, you know, how, oh, I've never done this before. Just go for it. Just make it. Yeah, absolutely. I, there's something I've been telling a lot of the lifters lately is uh, is that this lift needs to be a made lift in your mind before you even walk up to the bar. That is such a good mantra to repeat over and over in your head um, and also gets you to do some visualization of the lift and, and getting it to be something that is actually a successful lift in your brain before you even try to attempt it. One example of a really heavy lift, if you guys have never seen what this looks like, is uh, high and Palaku with a 211 clean and jerk. Have you ever seen this this lift? No, I don't think so. No, I'll play I'll play the video here for the YouTube people. Um, this is one of my absolute favorite lifts ever. This man barely deadlifts this bar. Like his knees are caving in on the pole. Like he can hardly break this bar off the ground. But he was so confident and so aggressive. That guy got it into his hips, launched it maybe an inch, and then he dove under that bar. It's one of the craziest clean and jerks I think I've ever seen. Um, and this was an unofficial world record. 211 kilos is like what? 460 ish pounds, somewhere around there. Um, which is pretty crazy. Uh, knowing what is possible helps a lot so that you don't think that you're, um, doing something wrong. If it feels heavy off the floor, it feels heavy off the floor for every single person, no matter what, that's when we're the weakest. That's where we're the most disadvantaged in the pull. So you have to be okay with the bar feeling heavy off the floor and, and not let it get in your head mostly. And just tell yourself that gravity is a choice and you can get under anything that you choose to. Yeah, totally. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on this one? No, I think uh, clerking, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be probably a long term thing that you're gonna deal with for a while. You know, there's not really a quick fix because it's this really deep ingrained kind of thing in your brain that you have these numbers that you've decided you're not capable of. Yeah, you just decided I cannot do that, and I'm yeah. gonna try it and see what happens. And if anything feels off, I'm gonna freak out. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know that is actually a really good tip, and I've I've talked about this with some of our other lifters as well. Uh, sometimes we get into this trap of thinking that some weights are our weights and then other weights just beyond that are suddenly not your weight. Like that is not the case at all. If you're training hard, you will continue to make progress. It would be, it would be unrealistic for you to not be able to hit heavier and heavier weights over time. But if you've been training for a while, maybe you've stalled out a little bit, suddenly your brain starts to think, oh, you know, I'm really good in the... 100 to 110 kilo range, but suddenly once it gets to 115, I don't know. We got to remove that from your idea. Uh, you got to remove that idea from your brain and just uh, every single weight that you attempt is your weight. That is a great way to think about it. It's helped me a lot too. Taking a quick break to let you know that this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the eight week Ollie building program. Guys, this is the most fun I've ever had on a weightlifting program. I love weightlifting and hitting big lifts, but I also love how bodybuilding makes me feel. So I put together a program that prioritizes equally both weightlifting and bodybuilding. It's not just a couple sets of accessories at the end of a normal weightlifting program. This is a true 50-50 split between weightlifting and bodybuilding, so you can build a ton of muscle while also increasing your snatch and clean and jerk. You can find the program linked in the description below, and if you use discount code LASTSETPOD, you can save 20% on the program. All right, back to it. Question number two comes from Isaac Hunter on Instagram. He asks, uh, I feel like I'm getting weaker. What do I do? Um, you ever been in this boat before? Uh, no. no. Well, I mean, I, I guess, right? Like, I mean, obviously you have down periods in your training where you're like, yeah, I'm not capable as what I was capable of three months ago or six months ago. But that is a total part of training. Like you can't just be peaked on everything. Everything's always going up at at the same times. Always. Yeah. Like 
sometimes your squats have to take a back seat for your Olympic lifts to get better. Yeah. Sometimes you're, you know, you're going to do a squat block and then you're going to do a pulling block. And when you're in the pulling block, your squats aren't as good. Like it's just part of the, part of the sport. Um, part of taking a well-rounded approach to your training is that you're not going to be in peak shape always. Yeah. And, and something else to keep in mind on that too, is that, um, you, one, you can't be in peak shape all the time, especially the more advanced you get, you're going to find that, that you'll have really high peaks, but then um, you're not going to be able to maintain that because it takes so much work to get up to that point. You shouldn't be at a peaked position all the time. Um, and along with that, I think uh, I think a lot of people think that they're getting weaker when really they're just measuring in a bad way. Um, so you, you put on here, uh, what are, what are some ways that you're measuring progress? What, what are you looking at when you're measuring progress in your training? There are a million ways. There's like so many ways you can measure progress. Now, what do you think the one that most people go to as their number one way Ryan, Dude, is? It's weight on the bar. Yeah. It's that PR. Have I hit a PR? When was my last PR? Mainly snatch and clean and jerk <laughs> is when this is coming into play. And that's a pretty poor way to measure progress, especially if you've been lifting more than a year or two years, three, maybe and especially like three years, you know, like, for instance, like talking to Hampton Morris, like, you know, he's hit PRs in the, in the clean and jerk and the snatch, like well over a year ago, well over a year ago with, with no new PRs, but you go check his Instagram, um, you're scrolling through his Instagram, you see he's PRing on all these little complexes. These different, you know, hang clean triple plus one kilo PR, you know, strict press for 10, you know, plus two kilo PR, <clears throat> where these might not be typical things that people track in their head. Like, what's my 10 rep max strip, strict press? Like, I couldn't tell you what mine is right now. But if you're the kind of person that's like in their head about, you know, what weights you're doing, it might be beneficial for you to get a, a, a tracking app. Like, I know Hampton uses Beyond the Whiteboard. If you work with me or Brian um, through coaching, you're going to have access to Train Heroic, uh, where you can log some of your training, and you know <clears throat> it, it'll tell you it'll tell you what your PRs are, what your best is in the past. Something that um, Travis Mash used to talk about back in the day was uh, all of his lifters in person. He would have them just get a one notebook, and on the front of it was uh, just a piece of paper, and he would have a grid, and it would say you know snatch, clean, jerk, power snatch, power clean. Um, and those were at least, and, and squat and front squat, I believe those were the main exercises. And the second page would be all of the main variations or complexes that you would do. And then he would have a grid on the other side. That would be how many reps it was. And so you would just go in and track your PR for each of those. And then if you ever beat any of those PRs, whether it was your five rep max front squat or whether it was your two rep max power snatch, you would go in and keep track of it so that you have something tangible to look at to see I am actually progressing all the time. Uh, because a lot of the time people feel like they're weaker, but they're maybe not actually right about it. It's easier to get tricked by our brains than we think. Um, so assess whether this is actually true or not, right? Having benchmarks like this is a great way to do that. Um, but a lot of the time people also, when they ask this, what they might actually be thinking is, are you not progressing at the rate that you want to be progressing at? We all, especially high performers, want to progress as fast as possible and want to make a lot of progress. Uh, but even higher performers understand that progress takes time. Uh, so, you know, don't try and rush the process if that is the actual issue here. Um, so, yeah, that is that's one thing. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind with this question is, are you expecting results that you maybe haven't worked for? I don't think that that's the case in a lot of the people that follow us, but sometimes, you know, if you're not training hard, you're not going to get the results that you want, but you could be training hard, but if you're not following a logical training program or training progression, uh, then it's, you're, you're, you can train as hard as you want to, but you're going to run into a wall that, uh, it helps to have a coach help you with that. Um, so with a, you know, with a weightlifting progression, what would that look like for you? Cause I know you had a pretty good one for, uh, for your, your weightlifting program that we just put out. Yeah. If you're new to programming, if you're new to something thought out, maybe your, your past ideas, just coming in and doing exercises, doing kind of whatever you want. It's like a lot of people out there, they just, you know, kind of randomly decide to do a certain set of reps. Um, it's really important to have something thought out 
it's a, the most simple version that I use, for instance, in my in my 12-week weightlifting program uh, is going to be like a linear progression. Um, this works really, really well for beginners. And uh, really just what linear progression means is that the weight on the bar continues going up. Now, you can do this in different ways. <laughs> now, you could, you could say do five sets of five um, at 70% week one, then you do five sets of five at 75%. Then you do five sets of five with a heavier weight and a heavier weight, and you keep going till you can't. Um, that's a common strategy used by some beginners um, to help build their strength. Uh, but what, what I like better is a more <coughs> uh, periodized model where what you're doing is as the weight is going up, the amount of sets are going down. So this is exactly how I use it in the 12-week weightlifting program. Uh, week one, we're starting out with five sets of eight on our squats, deadlift, clean deadlifts. Um, the front and the back squat, yeah. And then the next week, four sets of eight. The week after that is kind of a, a really tapered volume at, at two sets of eight. Um, and the, the percentage is going to go up from all three weeks of those. Then the next week, you're into five sets of five. And that weight has stayed the same or gone up a little. Um, then you're going to be four sets of five, then two sets of five. Um, and so that just offers an opportunity for the weight to keep going up as you keep pulling back volume through sets and reps eventually. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Um, let's say if you were wanting to do some sort of a uh, Olympic lifting progression, something that you could do and a lot of people will do is um, progress the complexity of the movement. So, you know, maybe uh, the first four weeks you're going to do uh, snatches from the hip or maybe a complex of a hip snatch plus a snatch. Um, the nature of that is you're not going to have as much time to pull and create power. So you're going to have to use lighter weights, but you can try and push those for four weeks. Uh, the second four weeks, maybe you do a slow pull snatch or a pause snatch or um, just a snatch for a double, uh, which you could do probably a good amount more than you could from the hip, but not nearly as much as you could do for singles, which you, maybe you do for a four-week block after that is push uh, push for heavy singles on the snatch um, and build up and weight each time. So you're um, progressing not just the weight, but you're also progressing the complexity of the movement and the technique a little bit, and you can get real creative with that. Um, if you know you start to know how uh, your technique breaks down or as you become more advanced, um, something that you could do is what I like doing right now is a, is a 12 week cycle where we do four weeks of working on your weaknesses, uh, then four weeks uh, prioritizing your strengths, and then another four weeks peaking for heavy singles. Um, so I've got an athlete right now week back and she's not super fast under the bar. So we do four weeks of snatches and cleans from the hip and then heavy, heavy deadlifts. Then four weeks of, uh, of doubles in the snatch and clean and then um, normal squats and uh, uh, instead of pause squats. And then the final four weeks, we remove a lot of that fatigue and just get practice with the heavy single on the snatch and clean and jerk. All this time, we're building strength, one, first in the four weeks, um, building strength and our weak points, then using all that into our strengths, and then finally testing out at the end of it. Uh, that's a pretty solid progression that you can use as well. Um, do you have any other things that you wanted to cover on this question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like most of the time, I would say like a lot of people try and seek out like their st stuff on their own, um, trying to like figure out things on their own path, but you're always going to be more like progressing more quick if you're with a coach, if you're with someone that's been doing it for a really long time. So, you know, very, very subtle plug for me and Brian here. But, you know, if, if you guys do want help with your lifts, reach out. If you want help with programming, reach out and we can try and point you in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. We'll uh, we'll link down the description, the link for your one to one coaching. Um, and then I can't really do any more one to one coaching. I don't have the time for it, but I do have a team program. Um, and it's, you know, 19 to $29 a month for programming and video reviews. So uh, we'll link both of those down in the description below. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, get into question number three here. Uh, so Kobe on TikTok asks, how do I get stronger for my jerks? My cleans always feel good, but I can't seem to put it together and finish with the jerk. Uh, so, um, 
Kobe, I actually went and looked at some of your lifts uh, after you asked this to just get a little bit more like specific advice for you. Um, so first of all, like if this is the case for anybody else out there, if you come from a background that prioritized cleans or leg strength, um, this is pretty common with most American sports, uh, then it makes sense that your cleans are going to feel a lot better than your jerk, right? The jerk really the only way to get good at it is to just do lots of jerks where you can maybe be pretty good at cleans just from having a background in doing squats and front squats and stuff. Um, so you're just going to need to do more practice with the jerk and focus less on the clean a little bit, um, especially because as you're, as you get more advanced, your cleans will fatigue you a lot more than your jerks will. If you're, if you have a really big discrepancy between the two, so it, it may be unnecessary fatigue on the clean to really be pushing it all the time. Um, so some things that you could do to work on this one, I would do, um, probably my favorite thing to do here is a clean followed by multiple jerks. Um, we just ran a really simple progression with one of the teams where we did one clean followed by three jerks for four weeks. And we, that was our anchor lift that we were trying to push, uh, add five to 10 pounds every week, a couple kilos every week, if you can, then for the second four weeks you do one clean, two jerks, um, which I think might be one of the hardest complexes out there. It is brutal, especially the re-rack dude. You feel your soul leave your body every time. Uh, but something about the re-racking is pretty beneficial i found it really does seem to help um, especially with people who are afraid of jerks i believe um, and then a, a four-week block of just uh singles on the clean and jerk and just doing those heavy doubles on the jerk um, really helps a lot with that um, so that's one way to just get more practice with it um, you can always do you know jerk primers too um, especially if they're not super heavy they won't be as fatiguing and you can do them more often to just like accelerate your skill in the movement. So some examples of that would be um, tall jerks are an example of that. You're not really going to be able to go very heavy, but you can get some benefit from it. Um, another example is uh, the jerk from split. That's one that we're doing on the team program right now, uh, where we're working mostly on our balance in the split position. Um, but probably one of the best ones, if footwork is an issue for you, if you're inconsistent with where you place your feet, is just doing body weight footwork drills because they're not fatiguing on the body. Um, you can do as many of them as possible and still get benefit from it. If your brain just needs to practice putting your feet in the right spot right now, you know, if we start to get a little bit more advanced and you do a great job of putting your feet in the right spot with all of your light to moderate weights, but with the heavier weights that stops being an issue, then footwork drills might not be as beneficial for you. And you might get more benefit from just practicing heavy jerks um, along with doing one simple thing in your technique. And that's pausing in the split. Like this is just a game changer for understanding where you need to be and making micro corrections to your balance, your foot position, your, your, your tension and your abs and pushing up on the bar. Pausing in the split is probably one of the best things that you could do if you want to fix your jerk. Um, but Calvin, I know that you've had a, kind of a struggle with the jerk for a while. You want to talk about what's helped you? Yeah, absolutely. For, for the longest time in my training, like I, my jerk really lagged behind my clean. Um, <clears throat> like I would, I think my rack jerk PR or block jerk PR was like, only 125 when I was doing regular clean and jerks with 140. Um, <laughs> like I was always better after the clean too, um, which is, is not how it should be in a, in a, you know, an advanced level weightlifter. And so like what, what, what I saw kind of happen in, in my technique and stuff <laughs> is that, that there wasn't any huge, you know, massive changes in my technique. Um, but especially w with just the comfortability and more time put in doing lots of jerks. Um, <clears throat> so like, you know, there is, there is changes in my dip. Um, especially like I, I used to dip really far into the toes, um, and, and really not be using my hips as strongly, <clears throat> but now, now I'm using my hips a lot better. My hips stay back like they should. Um, and, and this has led to me, you know, jerking as much as like, like last week I jerked 170 kilos three times. Um, and wow. So <laughs> thank you, Brian. Um, and yeah, really, really the, my big things that I focus on, Brian hit on a lot of them. I, I do those footwork drills myself a lot. Um, <clears throat> really being intentional in those lighter weights 
and before you even get up to the bar to emphasize your, your split footwork and, and things like that. Most people like only try and work on it once they're at a weight where it starts going bad. Like you can hide in that lightweight for a while. Um, <clears throat> so another, another thing um, is, is that front squats are just super important for the jerk, being really strong in that front, front rack. Um, especially after front squats, uh, what, what I like to do is, is some jerk dips just with the timing, pop it up about to eye forehead level. Um, or doing that after your, your jerk sets, <clears throat> most people have problems in their dip. Like most people, it's like having problems in your starting position in the snatch or the clean. It is the low hanging fruit. If you have problems in your dip, you're almost always going to have tr more trouble in the split position, in the receiving position. Um, so working on your dip <clears throat> and then re-racks, like Brian mentioned as well, huge thing for me. Like if your jerk is bad, do not go in the blocks. Like, do not use the jerk blocks, like, if you have them available. Like, you need to be doing re-racks, because what a re-rack is is essentially a reverse jerk. Like, you have to bend your, bend your arms a little bit, go up on your toes and catch it, and then absorb it down into the dip position. <clears throat> so it's essentially like an extra rep of practice in all your jerk positions. Don't just drop the bar onto your chest however you want to, like, just because you can. This isn't CrossFit. This isn't just getting from point A to point B. We're trying to do it the most efficient way we possibly can um, to keep drilling that technique every chance we get. Every time you walk up to that jerk bar, I want you to unrack it the same from the rack. I want you to find the same foot position, take the same breath, move your head the same. Everything you do should be similar. It's an extra rep of practice. One, one thing that um, you can do, especially if you're not sure if you are doing something different every time, is take a video of all of your lifts and then put them all on top of each other and see what, what the differences are. Um, you might be kind of surprised that like your heavier lifts maybe are a lot sloppier than you thought that they were. Um, it's kind of cool to see stuff like that too. Um, so yeah. And, and with the re-rack thing, I, um, used to be anti re-racks cause they hurt too much and I was a bitch about it. Um, and, uh, and recently I've switched my position on that one, just seeing how effective that a lot of top athletes are, are with them. Um, Two is when we went to go visit Hampton, he was doing a clean and jerk complex and it was like a 140, two power cleans, two jerks or something like that. And just watching him just absolutely manhandle 140 down to his shoulders and just like, and not be bothered by it at all blew my mind. I uh, like that changed my opinion completely. I've re-racked every jerk since then. It was cool. Yeah, Hampton is no stranger to doing that extra work. I'll tell you this too, when he does squats, you know, say he has a heavy set of eight or 10, um, as a top set. Now, most of us would cheat a little bit on that warm up. We're doing sets of four and five in the warm up on the way up. He is doing sets of 10 the whole way up. He is doing and taking not very large jumps either. You know, say he has a set of 10 at 170 kilos. He's going 110 kilos, 120 kilos, 130 kilos, 140 kilos. He's building up slow, getting accumulating all that volume, that training volume. Um, <coughs> um, so that's that's something cool about him. Yeah, absolutely. So to recap, Cove, um, on this, a couple things that will help <coughs> is, one, just doing lots of jerks and not as many cleans. So one clean plus a bunch of jerks. You could even do front squat plus jerk um, as a complex and just doing a lot of them. Pausing in your split is a really good way to make micro corrections to your technique if you have issues in the split. And then do footwork drills and primers as often as you possibly can. Because if that's your if that's the thing that's holding you back, that's the bottleneck, that's the only thing you should be focusing on. Like that should be your biggest priority. Because if you get that unlocked, remember we compete in the total. If you can unlock that jerk, you can add sometimes 20 to 30 kilos to your total if there's a big difference between your clean and your jerk. So really important to do that. Really important to do that. Um, do your front squats. Get strong in that front rack position. Um, do some jerk dips or work in your technique there. And don't be afraid of re-racking the bar. Um, guys, we're going to go ahead and go into a rapid fire question now. Um, rapid fire for us means probably about five minutes per question uh, and not, not 30 seconds. Um, so uh, question number one, DFAM on TikTok asks, is there such a thing as progressing too fast? What are your thoughts on this? There's totally, uh, you have to look at the difference between progression and then just what weights you're putting on the bar. 
So are you actually getting stronger or are you just doing heavier weights and kind of redlining your training? Yeah. Because you, you can look at training, you know, there's obviously a line that over time points upwards and there's also a line, you know, kind of below that. So there's two lines. There's you redlining and going as heavy as possible all the time. There's also you taking a back seat, maybe not taking those heavier weights. And I think those rates can actually progress at the same speed. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to be going as heavy as possible always to keep progressing. And what, what sort of I think ends up happening is if you're at this red line, top line, you get hit with an injury, you get hit with overtraining, you have to pull back. And so this, this lower line where it might seem like you're doing like lighter weights actually ends up winning sort of a tortoise in the hare kind of situation. <clears throat> But, uh, yeah, what do you think, Brian? That's a great way to put it. I, I think of it kind of like those two lines. That top line is weights that you can get away with, and then the bottom line is weights you've earned. And ideally, you want to really be pushing the weights you've earned line up over time. And if you do that, your weights you can get away with line will increase over time. But ideally, we don't take as many attempts at those weights you can get away with over time just because they tend to be a little bit riskier and, um, you know, it's it's not super necessary. Something else that I want to cover on this uh, as far as progressing too fast, this applies mostly to beginners, but if you're a newbie, I want you to try and prolong the newbie gains for as long as possible by not overreaching. So a simple example of that is the Texas method. It's a very popular beginner squat program. It's five by five, add weight every week until you can't anymore. Um, I've heard of people who have used this Texas method to get to a 405 pound squat from an empty barbell by only adding five pounds every week. Now, the first couple of weeks that you do this, you might feel like you can add 10 or 20 pounds or even more than that every week. Um, and if you want to put that weight on the bar, you can. But by rushing those beginner gains, you might be pulling away from your ability to maintain those beginner gains for longer. So you might be able to progress for a longer period of time with easier training than you would if you were to try and rush those numbers. Now, it's not to say that you shouldn't try and push yourself in your training, but uh, that is one thing I like to have people prolong their newbie gains for as long as you can because it starts to get a little bit harder after that when they uh when they when those newbie gains stop um anything else on this question that you wanted to go over yeah no definitely like that concept of, of redlining just you don't need to be pushing heavy all the time to be making progress yeah like, absolutely yeah just work on your stuff do your strength movements you'll get better yeah Absolutely. Question number two from the rapid fire. Zach Crenshaw from Instagram asks, what's the weight distribution on the front leg versus back leg in the split jerk? Easy. Go for it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's always going to be about 50, 50. It should be 50, 50. Yeah. Now I, I take that back. It's not always going to be because most people, what they're, they're dealing with the problem of being usually too heavy on the front foot. I've almost very, very rarely you'll ever see someone that has too much weight on their back foot. Very rarely. <laughs> Although sometimes if you do see that, you'll see someone immediately be getting pulled backwards um, that after they split. Like they'll immediately recover the front foot as soon as possible. Um, or what you'll see when someone's most of the time with the cases, the heavy on the front foot, um, is they're going to recover with their back foot first, which you should not be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, yeah, most people will be too forward on the front leg. Um, most of the time, especially with beginners, the reason for that is uh, keeping that back leg too straight. There should be some bend in that back knee uh, a little bit to kind of absorb and hit the hit the lowest part of your dip there. Um, so something that you can work on too, if you do have a struggle with your weight distribution on the split, uh, even though you have a good split position, right? If your footwork is good, um, then balance is probably your issue. Uh, strike jerks from a split. This is something we are doing on the Ollie Strong team right now as a primer. And I had like on the first day of it, I had probably six people message me be like, wow, this is like opened my eyes to understanding the balance a little bit more. All you do is get into a split position, start with the bar on your front rack position, and you're essentially going to perform a push jerk, right? We're going to dip to the bottom of your split, drive up, and then dip again into the bottom of your split trying to prevent that front knee from going forward. We should try and keep a vertical front shin and keep that bent knee, uh, the back knee bent. Um, so that is a great drill to work on those three to five sets, two to five reps with some pretty light weight. That'll help get you right. Um, yeah, question number three for the rapid fire questions here. Patricia 
from uh, from the FSU weightlifting team that I'm I'm coaching. Uh, she asked, "What's the draw of different styles of lifting, like weightlifting versus powerlifting?" Yeah, for me, um, like I think powerlifting really is sort of like the gateway drug to weightlifting. Sometimes, yeah. like I think it's the simpler version of, of the competitive uh, strength sport. Um, you look at all strength sports. Um, you know, bodybuilding, actually competing in bodybuilding is quite a, a grueling process. Um, and strongman has like so many different implements and, and things you have to do. So I think powerlifting has the easiest barrier to entry for just your average person who goes to the gym. Every gym has the equipment you need to do powerlifting, yeah. except Planet Fitness. But um, <laughs> even then, you could probably get away with doing some training sessions there. Um, even if they do have the Smith machine compared to the regular barbell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just easier to get into powerlifting. So I don't know if that's the, I mean, that's a big draw to it for a lot of people. Now, some people are just like, I like powerlifting because I don't have to think as much as I would if I were weightlifting, or I don't have to work on my mobility as much. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons that now I'm not here to dog on powerlifting. Powerlifting is a really cool sport. And one of the biggest benefits of it is like man those guys move some impressive weight so if you want to be just the strongest person you possibly can powerlifting is a great way to get into that but um if you're like me or you know like you i, I think weightlifting has a different draw um so i'll tell you what got me into weightlifting kind of what keeps me into weightlifting um i started weightlifting through crossfit uh and i w allowed myself to lift um, weights with not great technique, uh, until I got to a certain point, And then I was like, man, you know what, if I want to hit bigger and bigger lifts, I need to really dial this in. So I remember trying to, at the time I called it a squat snatch, which, uh, just like makes me cringe now. Uh, but, uh, I was trying to do a snatch with 60 kilos and, uh, I'd never done it like that before. Uh, so I gave it, I think it took me 10 attempts and I got it on the 10th one and it just felt effortless. And I was like, Oh, that's how I need to do this every time. I just need to do it like that. And so I put uh, two kilos on and I tried to go a little bit heavier and, uh, and failed it immediately. I was like, okay, all right, something I'm going to revisit this. But that moment, the 10th one where I stuck it and it just felt effortless. I was like, Oh, there's something to this. This is a good feeling. And, um, and that hooked me. That was it for me. Um, I, I have not been able to stop since then, um, in some way trying to either improve my technique or put up bigger numbers. Uh, and, and what I like about it too, is that I am consistently surprised by how much more there is to learn about two movements than you could possibly imagine. And, and, uh, and there's something about the mastery of it that is such a draw. I think it's a lot cooler to be a master of one thing than to be like kind of okay at a lot of things. And that's just a personal preference for me. Um, what about, what about you? What got you into weightlifting? What keeps you into it? Yeah, totally. Like I was first introduced to weightlifting movements, uh, through my, my high school, like strength classes that we had, uh, we would do the clean <laughs> or maybe the power clean, some variation of hang clean, maybe. Um, and, you know, I, I really like these movements, um, and I especially wanted to apply them for getting better at track, you know, wherever I had heard it. I, you know, I've always been kind of interested in exercise science, like, yeah, like doing these cleans is going to get you more powerful compared to just doing a really slow squat. <clears throat> and so I wanted to get better at track. I wanted to, like, really push that stuff. Um, in the process of doing that, you know, I... I kind of kept getting injured on the track, uh, on the track. Like I would pull my hamstrings all the time. I never got injured lifting. Like I've still never been injured like during a lift and knock on wood. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, that, that it kind of had the draw of like, Oh, it feels like I'm, I'm a little better made for this lifting stuff. Um, and then I found out that there was some high school records that we were keeping. I'm like, Hey, like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close. Like, I think I was doing 215 clean and jerk at the time. Um, or I, I had never even tried the jerk, but I could clean 215 uh, pounds. And then I'm like, well, you know, wouldn't be that hard to, like, add to 245 is what the record was. So I'm like, all right, let's do it. All that summer I worked on it. I, I looked up a bunch of, uh, you know, resources online. I actually would end up uh, reaching out to Brian um, at some point to tag him in my videos. 
um, way back when, when I was just searching Olympic lifting stuff online. And, uh, you know, I, I just kind of found a love for it in that. I'm eventually getting a, a college reaching out for, to me, a college program reaching out to me. I had no idea that was even a thing, um, but they were about 25 minutes from where I grew up. And, <coughs> yeah, I, uh, I decided to, you know, go tour their program, talk to their coaches more. I remember the first day I walked in, I saw our assistant coach snatched about 130, 135 kilos, and that just blew my mind. Like, I was, like, <laughs> stuck at, like, 60 kilos at the time. Like, I would, like, fail, like, 135 pounds all the time, and this guy's just throwing 280 like it's nothing. Um, so, yeah, I really found a deep love for, you know, I, I've always had just a love of sport in general, but applying it to something that felt like I was built more for this, like ever than I'd felt about running, about track or cross country in the past. I never felt like I was made for that. I mean, hell, I was I was squatting 405 mid cross country season, like while running like 30 miles a week. Like that's amazing. And so yeah, like I, I never really had the genetic like make up to be a cross country runner, right? Like, um, so I, I definitely felt more drawn to that weightlifting. Um, and yeah, the rest is history kind of thing. Yeah. You get bit by the bug and then you just got to keep doing it. I don't know. Something about it, something about it. Powerlifting is a little bit easier to get into, but if you can find a good coach to help you out with weightlifting, um, it's just got, it's always got something to keep you coming back. Um, and there's always a little bit more progression that you can make in it. Um, but I think that's going to do it for the pod today. Um, uh, so, uh, Calvin, where can, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, go look for me at Calvin Lackey, 81 KG. Um, if you're listening after December, 2024, that might be Calvin Lackey, 89 KG. Um, but, uh, just go look up Calvin Lackey. You'll find me. Yeah. And uh, you can find me at Big Ben Strength on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, and you can find the link to all the articles and the programs that we put out in the videos down in the description below. Um, all right, guys. We'll, uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Uh, later. <laughs>